Hey, there you are, Team Healthy. My microphone set here. Glad to have you guys with me here today. You know that I just, um, I, I love jumping in here a few minutes early and kind of watching the live chat that you have here. Those of you who are watching this on uh, Take Delay, which is most of you, uh, you're missing something if you don't get in on the live chat. We got a, we have such a great group here on Team Healthy and encouragement and uh, funny comments. Um, I appreciate somebody talking about, somebody saying that the, uh, the narcissist took the two uh, took the toupee from somebody and cut it up and threw it out in the yard. Uh, then somebody put on here toupee today, grass tomorrow. Ugh. <laughs> These individuals they're they're so creative in the way that they try to show you who's boss, right? Okay. Today we're going to be talking. And by the way, those of you who are new, please know that uh, what I do is I pick up questions through the week, and then on Tuesday, or excuse me, on Wednesdays we have our live feed with Doctor C. So. Uh, so it allows me to take the questions that you've sent me throughout the week, and then I'll respond to them here. And, and I get to know you a little bit more, and I get to uh, uh, actually ask questions that are much more particular and specific to your lifestyle. So today, we're going to be talking about questions relative to the scheming style of the narcissist. They just cannot stop themselves from being schemers. And basically, that means they're trying to gain an advantage over you. And if honesty eh, has to be pushed off to the side, if decency, if civility has to be pushed off to the side, I'm okay with that. That's how they think. Now, before we dive all the way into our very first question here, I want you to understand that you know a lot of people ask, well, how can you tell if a person is um, just kind of narcissistic versus all the way narcissistic? And there's one uh, particular ingredient that's part of the defining feature of narcissism, and that's the ingredient of exploitation or manipulation. It's every one of us has a tendency towards wanting to be a little bit too much in control, or sometimes we can get selfish, our defenses and that false self and all can and can creep in. And those are not good characteristics, but sometimes we can get caught up in that. And that, of course, is part of the defining feature of narcissism. But when the person has those ingredients, plus they're willing to say, I'd like to build myself up at someone else's expense. And they go into that scheming mode, the exploitive mode. That's when you know they've crossed the line. And so uh, once a narcissist is all the way into their own self-absorption, entitlement, then it's almost an inevitability that they're going to do some form of scheming against you. And as we're going to see here through the questions, it, it can show up in so many different ways. Now, the first question I'm going to address here is one that I received multiple questions on, and it's about uh, alienation from a parent um, by the narcissist, when, when the narcissist is alienating the children from the other parent. And it's got to be one of the most insidious ways of a narcissist uh, going about their business of elevating themselves at someone else's expense, the scheming. And it has such strong, strong implications. So here's the question, and let's see if we can figure out, you know, you know how we're going to respond to this. And I'm just going to be straight up with you. There's not a really good response to, uh, to these kind of situations, but here we go. Th this person asked, when children have a narcissistic parent that they've never really gotten along with, and then an empath parent who was kind and loving and supportive, why do these kids end up being narcissists as adults? Why do they end up siding with the one who abused them and not the one who is empathic and loving? Now, this captures the uh, the frustration that so many individuals have. Um, I, I spoke not that long ago to a, a divorce attorney, and he was talking with me about uh, how he actually sees more and more of these kind of cases of parental alienation. And this is a fellow who's roughly my age. He's in his late sixties and he's been around the block just like I have. And it's like, it, it just seems to be more common right now. Why is it that the negative person tends to win? And it, this illustrates how power and authority and dominance short term can have more sway than kindness and tenderness. Go figure. 
Um, part of the narcissist uh, scheming is that uh, they're going to try to portray the empath's goodness as being phony. One of the things that I see that's very common with parental alienation, or sometimes it's also with grandchildren, grandparent alienation, is that that more narcissistic parent can go to the kids, and sometimes it starts really early, and say something like, well, your mother, you know, I, I know she's trying, but there, there's something wrong there. Or your father is, uh, he, he tries to make himself look good out in public, but we know behind the scenes he's flawed too. And, and they, there can just be this real uh, systematic whittling away, whittling away, whittling away at that person's credibility. And when the, uh, the healthier parent comes along, and by the way, parental alienation is defined in part by the fact that the parent being alienated has no particular need to be alienated. I mean, if the, if the, the parent being alienated was a child abuser, then uh, they, they deserve to be alienated, but that's not what we're talking about. Um, but nonetheless, it, it illustrates how that negativity can overshadow the kindness because it's its own form of gaslighting. You don't think that that parent or that grandparent is really all they purport to be. I mean, they try to come across as friendly. And, and as a result, um, the child is thinking, well, uh, I guess you know, maybe what I'm seeing isn't very accurate. And I, I'm, I'm perplexed by the fact, just like this uh, uh, person is asking the question, is that um, the dominant person wins just by virtue of the fact that they shout louder or they are more successful, if you want to call it that, in creating doubt in the kid's mind. And, and, and basically what this implies is that uh, uh, a child, uh, excuse me, the parent who's alienating the other parent is preying upon the fact that the child is not wise enough yet to understand the manipulation, the scheming that goes on when that happens. And as a result, they can grow up having a lot of doubt uh, about the more healthy parent. I, 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 I've mentioned this before. But I had a really interesting run with a uh, in a counseling case with a guy who was 45 years old and his mother had taken him away from his father when he was 13 and moved to another state, actually came to Texas from an, uh, uh, an entirely different part of the country. And th this young man uh, wound up not seeing his father from age 13 to 45, 32 years. And the mother and her mother uh, made sure that he knew that the father was awful and terrible and had rages and all of this. At age 45, this this uh, this man who's middle aged by now, he, he began realizing, you know, my mother is just she's just such a hard person. She's so difficult. He looked up the father and found him back in the state where he had grown up with, and uh, and went to visit him and spent a, a three day weekend with him. And he came back to my office in tears. And the reason is, is he said, you know, my father explained to me the differences between him and his and my mother at the time, and he wasn't nearly the animal that he she tried to make him out to be. Uh, he had uh, he had some strains and difficulties, but all the while he was very willing to work with it. And she just continued to just pummel him verbally. And he said, you know, I was just a shell of who I needed to be because I just felt like uh, yeah, I, I couldn't subject you, the son, to all the stuff there. And this man said, I, I'm realizing now my mother was lying to me 32 years later. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm amazed that some parents think, well, it really is okay. I'm doing my kid a favor by turning them against the other parent when in fact, there's no compelling reason to do so. But the bottom line is uh, dominance and uh, authoritarianism tends to have sway in a short term in ways that kindness sometimes doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, happen. And I can only imagine there are times when that more dominant narcissistic parent tries to do that with uh, the, uh, the child. And sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes it does. And I, I'm, I'm so sick when I hear about that, because I mean, you're, you're talking about a generational kind of thing just can continue to be passed on. Okay. Another person asked, uh, let's go to the next question. Another person asked the question, how can narcissists be short-term thinkers and yet schemers? 
Now, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, that actually is part of the short-term thinking is part of their scheming. Narcissists, as a general rule, have what we refer to as a lack of future thinking. For example, if I yell at you right now, uh, future thinking would prompt me to think, well, wait a minute. If I'm yelling at somebody, and in particular, if I do that in a repetitive kind of way, where is this leading? You know, what's going to, uh, how's this going to impact the future that we have with one another? Because I don't think this is going to be too good. And so when you have healthy future thinking, you're thinking in terms of the big picture, then it's possible for you to learn to curb some of your more immediate impulses and, and keep that from running away from you. So when uh, uh, narcissists go into their scheming mode, the reason they stay with it is it's like, I'm not worried about what this does to the future, to you, to me, to anybody else that's watching. And as a result, these individuals are very uh, short-term self-gratification kind of people only. Uh, they're in survival mode, uh, which means as long as they feel like they're in the dominant position, then they win. And they don't really think about what that dominance does in the long haul. You know, if you've been dominated over a long, long period of time, then it's going to do something one way or another to you. Either it, it will uh, cause you to be a shell of a person. It can cause you to go into high rebellion. It can cause you to reject the person who's doing the dominating. But that narcissistic schemer's thinking, I don't want to mess with that right now. That, 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 that's not my concern. And so when you ask the question, how are they short-term thinkers and also schemers? Well, the scheming is part of their short-term thinking. They don't really care about the long-term repercussions. And that's part of that lack of empathy. It's part of the lack of conscientiousness that tends to go hand in hand with narcissism. Now, another person, if this is somebody who's uh, apparently trying to uh, had the notion that maybe we could work on something inside the home situation. This, this next question asks about marital counseling. Uh, this person asked, do you have any advice on surviving marriage counseling with a narcissistic spouse? Let me just pause right there. Earlier in my career, and keep in mind, I was uh, I, I maintained counseling uh, counseling practice for 41 years before retiring. Uh, but early in my career, uh, I, I did yeah I'm not going to say a lot of marital therapy, but about 25 percent of my cases, I would have both the husband and wife in my office because you know inevitably when you have more than one person inside of a system saying we'd like to make things better, then uh, actually that's a good thing. And so I'm I'm a proponent of marital therapy if both people are equally invested because that's a good thing. Um, but I, I found that many times when a marital uh, case came in, it, it was actually more of one person wanting to set the other person straight while that uh, initial person just denies whatever's going on. And it would be really interesting how uh, I, I could have one individual who would work a little bit too hard trying to butter up to me and make themselves look like they're just the sweet and, and innocent person. It could be the husband, it could be the wife. And, and as a result, uh, I, I began to uh, see that. And, and I, whenever I'd call that person out, then it typically didn't end well. You know, I might say something like, uh, hey, look, I know that you're focused on what's going on with your partner over there. Can we take a look at where you are, too? And when I would start going into that kind of space, then it tended not to end very well. I, I remember so well this one fellow, this is years ago, that he, uh, he, uh, he would bring his wife in and he was the most overbearing and dominant kind of person, but he tried to make himself out to be this uh, real strong spiritually based kind of an individual who's kind and all like that. But over time, it's like, uh, no, you're just a, a, a real overwhelming jerk is what you are. I mean, she, she had no freedom to think for herself whatsoever. So finally, one day I just said, I, I want to take a look at what's going on here when you're talking so strongly about the negatives that you see inside your wife. And what he did is he put his finger up like that and said, don't go there. Don't go there. And he was telling me, I don't have permission to confront him. And it's like, oh, well, this means we need to go there. And when I uh, talked with him about, you know, what his uh, method was and what his goals were and what the results were as uh, because of him just continually ripping his wife uh, to shreds. I mean, this guy showed some anger that had not been seen in my office in a long time. 
And, and unfortunately, there are some individuals who will bring a, a partner into counseling or they'll join their partner in counseling with the hope of winning, as opposed to with the hope of learning. And, and as a result, when you ask, uh, do you have any advice on surviving marital uh, uh, counseling with uh, a narcissist? Uh, if you're going to counseling and the narcissist continues to pull these kind of stunts, sometimes the therapist needs to say to the narcissistic person, I can tell you're not all that invested in your own personal growth. I'd like to see your partner separately. And sometimes that happens and, and I'd have to do it. Or if you're the partner who's being smeared and you realize that it's a real lopsided thing, I think it's fair to say to the therapist, may I have some individual time with you? And then we need to kind of figure out what's the game plan here. Uh, some therapists are not as um, attuned to the whole narcissistic pattern as others. They tend to just kind of go with what they see on the surface. Hopefully you can have a therapist who is able to see through it. And once they see through it, they call it out and they speak into it. Um, but make no mistake, uh, in the scheming pattern of the narcissist, uh, they'll even use um, what would ideally be a safe place like a therapist office as another place to run the partner into the ground. And so if you see that happening, then make sure that you uh, let it be known. If this is all it's going to be, I don't want to participate. And then if it's possible, seek your own uh, separate uh, counseling so that you can figure out how you're going to manage yourself as cleanly as possible, even when the narcissistic person continues being what they are. And there are many different things that you can do in therapy with respect to that. Um, but uh, it, if the therapist doesn't see it, then you just need to, uh, to move on. And, and, you know, when the, the narcissist says, see, you quit counseling. It's like, no, I, I, I stepped away from a situation where the scheming continued. That's all it is. Okay. That's, that's another one that's just tough. Okay. Now, another person asked, do you think narcissism runs in families? Do you think there could be a genetic predisposition to narcissism biologically, or is it strictly a learned behavior? So here you have a situation where mom or dad has some really strong narcissistic tendencies and the kids begin showing it. And uh, the question is, is that a learned pattern or is it uh, something that's just kind of uh, hardwired into them? And the answer is yes and yes. Um, studies will show, and when I say studies, twin studies or sibling studies or uh, stepkids and things like that, studies will show that um, uh, about 50% or so, the, the, the actual uh, uh, research says roughly between 40 and 60% of your temperament type, your personality style is pretty much hardwired. For example, uh, um, y'all have seen pictures of me with my little five-year-old granddaughter, Lorelai. And it may be a different story when she's 17. I don't know. But uh, I'm telling you, we, we got lucky on that because she just has the sweetest little disposition uh, and just uh, pleasant and pliable. And I mean, it's not like she didn't have moodiness from time to time, but she's genuinely a sweet kid. You've also seen other kids, let's say five-year-olds, who are just pushy and forceful, and they've been that way since they could interact with the world. And it's like, well, what causes one person to be that way and the other to be an entirely different? And some of it actually is just an inborn temperament kind of thing. And then the rest of it is uh, can be environmental. For example, with that really overbearing and uh, defiant kind of a kid, uh, they can actually have a natural predisposition toward that. Uh, and then because of that, the environment can reinforce it and keep it perpetuated. Like you are so exasperating. Why are you doing this? And you can speak with such agitation toward the kid that the kid just learns, I guess, agitation is a language around here. So I'll keep doing it. So sometimes the inborn temperament is reinforced then by the environment, just like when you have that kid that's, uh, uh, that's real sweet. And, uh, you know, the, the, the environment can reinforce that. And so that 50% of the inborn temperament actually has even more of an impact because people are playing off of that. If you understand what I'm saying with that, but it does go to illustrate that uh, many times uh, you can have a natural predisposition that is just there. Uh, the, the easy analogy is to say, and this is so common in other kinds of realms. For example, some people are just naturally inclined towards musicality and they can just pick up on that. Whereas others couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. 
some people are really good at math, whereas others is like, I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. I mean, there's just natural inclinations that we have in other areas. And so it stands to reason it would be that way inside personalities. And so when you ask the question, is this something that is just learned? Many times when you have that scheming and uh, manipulative narcissist, it, it's a learned pattern. Uh, sometimes it's because of peer circumstances or uh, these days, social media and things like that. Other times it's just hardwired into them. But uh, suffice it to say that uh, that person, as they age, still at, at some point needs to say, OK, if this is what I've got going on, then I need to take responsibility. But part of narcissism is they think, nah, I don't need to do that. I don't want to. Uh, now, another very interesting question. What happens when the inner child is just playing the victim card? Does the ego fight back with gaslighting? Uh, I, I did a video a while back on the, the, the narcissist inner child and how uh, that's a very hurt and, uh, and uh, held back kind of person they, they've not really fully developed. And then this person is asking, well, what about if they're an adult and they still keep playing the victim card? Look at what everybody's doing to me. Look at how much difficulty I have. I, I can't believe you talk to me this way and everybody's down on my case. And why does, why does someone do that? And the answer is because they think they can get somewhere by playing the victim card. That's part of the scheming. That's part of the, manip the manipulation. Uh, inevitably, when an individual uh, uh, declares themselves to be the victim, you know, everybody's down on my case. They've learned at some level it works. I'm going to try to make that person look bad. I'm going to try to uh, put shame on people. I'm going to try to uh, claim victimization because I want people to think that really I'm, I'm quite unique. I'm quite special. And, and as a result, if they have to diss someone in the process, they're, they're quite willing to do that. Um, if you're the narcissist and you're already playing the victim card, then uh, your victimization is your way of trying to gaslight other people into thinking, well, you're the problem. If you're the recipient of the, uh, the gaslighting, uh, sometimes you wind up gaslighting yourself. Uh, you wind up uh, going into your own self-doubt and your own suppression, or you feel like you have the imposter syndrome, you know, just because, you know, things uh, good happen to you, you begin wondering, well, yeah, but, you know, maybe I'm not all that good. Uh, I like that. So let's keep in mind that uh, one of the, the, the ways that schemers win is by declaring someone to be the low person, the victim. Sometimes the narcissist will play the victim card for themselves, and that's a form of gaslighting. Other times they'll make you out to be the victim, uh, which is uh, which is their way of saying you, you're just no good entirely, and that's another form of gaslighting. And so the more you're able to see it and the more you're able to see the, uh, the lack of objectivity, in other words, you're not examining the full picture, then I'm hoping as an adult with a certain amount of wisdom at your disposal, then you're able to move beyond that and think, wait a minute, one person's proclamation does not equal the sum total of everything that I am. And so I'm hoping that in your knowledge and in your insight and in your wisdom, uh, when somebody tries to run you down and make you out to be a, a victim or if they themselves play the victim, that you're going to think, you know, that's, that's, that's not the sum total of what an individual is. And so you learn how to see the fuller picture, uh, despite what that scheming narcissist is trying to accomplish. Okay. Now, speaking of schemers, uh, the, the, here's one. And I, I suspect that most of you have heard, have heard this phrase before from that narcissistic person. This person simply asks a simple question. What does it mean when they say, I don't know what you want me to say. And in other words, uh, you, you might say something like, I, I really wasn't pleased with the way this played out. Or I think that when we handle this over here with this uh, group of individuals, uh, let, let's make sure that we emphasize A instead of B. Or when you ask, why did this happen in the first place? Well, whatever it may be, the narcissist can sit there and say, I don't, I don't know what you want me to say. Now, Right there, there are multiple elements going on. Talk about gaslighting. Um, the, uh, the narcissist is trying to make you doubt the validity of you being you. 
So if you say, well, I have an impression or I have a plan or I have a preference, I have an interpretation and the narcissist, I don't know what you want me to say. It's their, it's their way of basically saying, um, I'm trying to make you look foolish. I'm trying to make you feel foolish. Is it working yet? And so they're, they're wanting you to doubt your legitimacy. Uh, in addition, it, it can be their way of what we refer to as victim shaming. For example, if you do say, you know, when you did A, it left this emotion in me that I'm uncomfortable with, and I, I'd like to talk, to, uh, talk it over with you. And then when they say, I don't know what you want me to talk about, the implication is, well, I set the thing in motion. You're the one struggling. Let's go ahead and keep the focus on you. And so they, they make themselves to be the one who uh, tries to create doubt in you by just making you feel ashamed for even bringing it up. And that, again, that's another one of their scheming kind of things. But uh, basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to get uh, you to doubt the validity of your perceptions and your feelings and your interpretations. They're trying to undermine your sense of confidence. And so that little bitty phrase, I don't know what you're uh, uh, wanting me to say. It's their way of saying, shut up, stop whining. You don't make any sense. But as, as part of their manipulative ploy, it's like, ah, let me be a little bit more subtle than that. And so uh, they just kind of go into the uh, realm of trying to create and then perpetuate uh, doubt, which is what gaslighting is all about. Know what you're dealing with. And so when the, the narcissist says, well, I don't know what you're trying to say, a, be clear. Well, what I'm trying to say is I didn't like this happening, or this is something that I want to emphasize. Go ahead and stand, stand your ground. And then when they still imply, well, I, I just think you're way off base, hold your ground. It's like, well, I know you think that, but the reason I'm saying what I'm saying is because it makes sense to me. Well, you, you're just always coming up with all this illogic. Uh, that's an interpretation that you have. It's not an interpretation I have. In other words, hold your ground calmly. It's what I refer to as your calm confidence. And, and then uh, you don't need to convince them of anything, but eventually you act upon your good common sense. And then when they still say, I don't know how you want me to respond, it's like you've made that quite clear. You don't have to say it out loud, but it's like that being the case, then if, if you're that uninsightful, I don't want to say ignorant, but that's what it is. Uh, then I, I just need to move on and be true to who I am and, and let them have their scheming kind of stuff, but don't play the game. Don't get caught in the uh, uh, over explaining of yourself or uh, justifying, et cetera. Uh, they are what they are, but you need to go ahead. And when you hear uh, the things like that, know that you're being messed with, you're being played. And it's like, mm, no, nope. what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand firmly on who I am. And if they can understand, wonderful. And if they don't, I'm better off by following through what I know is wisest and best anyway. Okay. Uh, here, here's another really interesting co uh, question. Can a person who was a victim of a narcissist become a narcissist because of the trauma they endured? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, there's another uh, aspect of this question. Yes, you can, uh, if you've been exposed to heavy narcissistic abuse, it is possible to become narcissistic yourself because we tend to fall back on what's familiar. I, I'm, I'm thinking right now of a man that I uh, have known for quite some time, and he would let you know that his father was mean and harsh and caustic and just nothing could ever please him. Finally died, and the, this guy would say it was a better world once he was uh, gone from the scene. And yet, as he engaged with individuals, he too was mean and caustic and invalidating. And when you look at what's going on there, it's like, why would you perpetuate then the thing that you complain so much about? And the answer, of course, he uh, would probably disagree is, well, the answer is because that's what you're familiar with. Uh, and so, yeah, sometimes we fall back on that. Um, and then the next question, the same person asks, uh, are there different levels of narcissism? Well, uh, and then when does it cross over from just having emotional issues to becoming narcissistic? 
And so, yeah, there are different levels of narcissism. You've heard me say that narcissism is a pattern on a spectrum. And uh, many times people can be so thoroughly entrenched in it that it's uh, uh, it, it's a full-blown personality disorder. And we tend to refer to that as the malignant personality. And on a scale of one to a hundred, these are the people that are at a 90, percent, uh, 90 percentile and above. Sometimes you can have some people that curtail it a little bit. And they're, let's say they're down at the 70% level and some are at the 50% level. Uh, healthy individuals, uh, nobody's going to be perfect. And, you know, they're not going to get rid of their tendencies altogether. They can be down around the 20% level, but they contain it. And when they see it, they're honest about it. And they, uh, they uh, make corrections pretty quickly. And so, yes, it can be on a spectrum. But uh, let's keep in mind that people often, because they were brought up with narcissistic family members, can sometimes pick up on that in the same vein that we pick up on the language that we speak or cultural norms and things like that. That's what was presented to us as the norm, and that's what we, we do. And it's only when uh, you become convinced, well, whatever was uh, presented as the norm is not, then I need to come up with a new set of norms. And sometimes that can be difficult because it can be like learning a whole new psychological language. Uh, by, by the way, um, I guess it's August the I can't remember. Well, it's early in August. It's on a Monday. I remember I have videos that come up. I've got one that's talking about rethinking the shame messages from a narcissist. And it's uh, it's one of my uh, my uh, best ones that I've done in a while. And it's all about uh, learning to uh, to rethink some of those hard messages that were in there. So I'm going to be uh, addressing this as we uh, go on further with our videos. OK, this next one's a really interesting one. And I'm going to do a video on this one as well. It's about gang stalking. Uh, this person says, I have a question about gang stalking. What is your take on it? Because I have an ex who has incorporated the gang he's affiliated with to stalk me 24 hours a day. He's trying to drive me crazy, but by God's grace, I ha have not been driven crazy. I want to say that there is more to the gang stalking that meets the eye. Now, what is gang stalking? First, let's realize that sometimes narcissism can be kind of a pack mentality and you can have systems, if you will, where there's a certain amount of groupthink that goes along and inside the groupthink, then they determine who's in versus who's out. And the, uh, the possibilities are endless. I mean, when we think about gangs, we, we think about, let's say street gangs or, uh, you know, where the, the, uh, the, the bloods and the crypts are against each other. Uh, we can have family systems that have gang, a uh, gang mentality. Typically there's a, a real strong overbearing dominant person. And you have a lot of either, uh, miniature narcissists or flying monkeys, which are typically miniature narcissists who say, yeah, what, what that person says. Or you can have political systems where you're either with us or you're against us. No middle ground. You can have religious systems. It's like uh, our way of thinking is the only way. And if you're not with us, then there's something dreadfully wrong with you. You can have social uh, systems or work systems where it's so fixed that anyone that comes along and says, hey, I think differently, well, then it's no good. And as a result, when a person such as yourself comes along and says, well, I, I don't go along with that entire group thing sometimes you have to brace yourself because the entire group is going to come after you. And uh, the, the implication is if you dare to say something against us, even in our dysfunction, then that means that you are a troublemaker. And what if you decide, well, I'm not being a troublemaker. I'm just trying to be true to who I am. And then they can just uh, perpetuate this whole uh, narrative you're negative, you're awful, you're difficult, you're the one who's creating all the problems here, when in fact, you're the one that's uh, uh, daring to say, here's what common sense says. And so, you know, what do you do when you're on the receiving end of this gang stalking? This person says this, they want to stalk me 24 hours a day, they just keep coming after me, letting me know how awful I am. At some point, it's like, I got to get away from the system. And I've known so many people who have said I've had to just break away from whether it's my family or my religious system, or I've, I've uh, just dropped my political affiliations or something like that. I, I, I just don't want to be around them. And uh, sometimes you have to narrow your group of, of insiders that you're going to uh, entrust with you know, self-disclosures. 
But uh, gang stalking is one of these things that can be really debilitating because let's say you have four against one, the gang is four, you're the one, you may have hundreds against one, or you may have an entire um, uh, collective, you know, like I say, in a political or religious system against one. And uh, at some point, when you know that you make sense, and when you know that you're genuinely trying to be a healthy and a, uh, a, a decency uh, based kind of person, and then they keep coming at you saying, well, our group uh, in our group thing declares you to be awful. It's like, I realize that, which is why I'm not going to be around you. I, I need to move on and get my uh, another group. Yeah. There's the old country song. And I don't mean to demean this, but uh, the, 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 the general gist of it is I, I'm ready for a better class of losers. <laughs> I, I need to move on. Uh, this class of losers isn't helping me a whole lot. I need to get a better class of losers. Uh, not my apologies to George Strait on that one. Uh, okay. Um, speaking of which, here, here we have, I had to go no contact, this person says, with my middle-aged child, adult child, for my own self-preservation. But then here's what the next part is. And this is part of that group thinking. This is part of the scheming part. But then I was made to feel shame for doing this. Why don't people understand that I had little other good choice? So here you have a person that says, I've, I've got a, a, a middle-aged adult child who has just proven to be impossible. I had to just completely break it off. And then apparently there is a, a system, a group of individuals who will say, well, it's, it's your daughter. It's your son. You, you can't do that. And it's like, well, I've tried everything I can. Well, you can't cut your kids off. What about the grandkids? What about this? What about that? And you may be over there just writhing in agony. And all these other people can do is to come along and say, well, I, I, I tell you what, I don't think I would have done something like that. I, I so distinctly recall, and this was well over 20 years ago, a good friend of mine who had gone through a divorce. And I went and spent uh, the day with him. Uh, he lived a couple hours away and I uh, spent a Saturday with him and uh, just uh, giving him some encouragement. And one of the things that he mentioned was, if I had known that going through a divorce was going to be this difficult, I would have been much more kind toward other people who were going through this. But now that I know, uh, it's, it's going to change for the better how I do approach people who have their difficulties. And, you know, when, uh, when some people see someone else going through a difficulty, in this case, the loss of a relationship with an adult child, my guess is you've never been through anything like that, have you? Uh, and you know, you've never quite taken the time to ask what would uh, prompt something like this to occur, and they don't develop empathy. My friend who went through a difficult situation realized this makes me a richer person, strangely, my own difficulties, and it allows me then to go into someone else's pain because I know what my pain is like. So when someone comes along and scorns you and shames you for having lost a key relationship, uh, my, my response is consider the source. This is someone who uh, doesn't have enough depth. They're, they're operating on a shallow, here, here's the way the formula works kind of mentality. And sometimes life doesn't fit formulas. And when you're in that case and your life doesn't fit the formula, then I'm hoping that rather than shaming and scheming and, and uh, guilting and all of that, that you can be the kind of person like my friend was who'll say, well, I'm going to take my experience and I, I, rather than being a manipulator because of it, I'm going to be all the more dedicated towards goodness and respect and honor. Uh, people going through strain and difficulty uh, need more and more of that. Sign me up for that. And I hope that can be the net result that you would have for that. Uh, another person, then the next one has a very similar kind of question. This person says, how do we deal with unsupportive good friends as we struggle with coping with narcissists? Are there simply no people capable enough to lend a hand when you're dealing with poor behavioral issues surrounding narcissists? And uh, unfortunately, uh, there are friends who just friends, quotation mark, who, who just don't want to take the time to know you from a full kind of way. 
um, they, they wonder, well, why can't you cope? And what they're saying is, because I don't have those experiences, as opposed to, um, this doesn't make sense to me. I'd like for it to make sense. Help me understand more fully what's going on inside of you. And so they can be honest about it. I, I'm not really familiar or comfortable with what you're going through, but you're my friend. And because I love you, I want to know more fully. So educate me. Tell me what it's about. There are so many people who can't think that way. And what it says is that uh, there's a lot of shallowness there. You've heard me say that a very high percentage of people don't really go into what I refer to as the intuitive style of thinking, where they go and break things down and analyze and think things through carefully. Uh, a very high level of or number of people just simply want simple answers. And when your life proves to be, well, more complex than that, you're going to see uh, who the, the real supportive friends are versus the shallow, you know, one size fits all kind of answer kind of people. And that being the case, you move on realizing, OK, you, you were a friend up to a point, but uh, I don't think you can be part of my close inner circle. <laughs> okay, let, let's go with one more. And this kind of takes us back full circle to the very first question we had about the parental alienation. This person says, what are your suggestions when kids are involved? If I've been abused by my husband, should I leave with the kids? And then it says ages 14. I don't know if this means that uh, they're twins or you have stepkids involved. I'm not real sure. But you have, uh, this is a, um, um, a mom who feels like she's being abused by the husband and then she's got a 14 or a two 14 year old kids. What do you say? What do you do? Uh, typically when a child is 14, as a general rule, they're more able to, uh, to discuss things in a, um, a fuller way at, at age 14, try to recall back when you were 14, you probably weren't terribly sophisticated, but at the same time at 14, you can probably see a lot more than what your parents think you can. And so there is a time when you uh, know that the scheming, the manipulation, the exploitation, the emotional uh, harassing has just gotten to be so much. I, I can't do this anymore. And so sometimes uh, you're going to need to sit down with the kids and talk. In fact, let's even take it further. Sometimes if you don't, then uh, the kids are going to wonder what kind of credibility you have. Well, I can see that dad is uh, uh, abusing you. Well, why aren't you going to do anything about it? Now, the key, though, is you don't want to get into uh, such a, a competitive mindset. Well, if you think I'm bad, you ought to see your dad, you know, that uh, that you uh, wind up just making the kids feel like they're caught in the middle. And so that's that's the, uh, the, the trick that you have to watch out for. When you have those schemers, one of the things that you want to do is you want to show yourself to be an objective person. So I would sit down with those 14 year old kids and say, Hey, look, I think you can kind of tell that your dad and I don't think the same. We don't prioritize life the same and we have different emotional reactions. In other words, keep it broad, keep it general, as opposed to, ah, oh, he's just constantly running me down and he's constantly doing, you don't need to get into uh, a harshness there. Uh, but you do want to acknowledge the, uh, the obvious and then let it be known, um, I'm doing the best that I can to try to create as much of a healthy environment here, but I'm having to consider what my options are. Just know that uh, this is not working out well. I know that you're confused sometimes when we have different preferences and priorities, um, but know that I love you because kids are always wondering, well, where do I stand? And I, I care about you. And, and as I make decisions relative to this, I want to do so in such a way that's going to be the best for everything, everyone. Now, I, that's an incredibly simple kind of answer uh, because obviously kids have different kind of needs and reasons and uh, capabilities and all of that. So if you have a situation like this where you're pondering whether you should divorce or not and then how to talk with your kids, that's where I would strongly encourage that you uh, break it down with a therapist who could uh, zero in on some of the unique elements that are a part of your life so that you're uh, managing it well. But I, I am one that says you want to go ahead and speak to the kids about it without turning them into your confidant or your therapist. And that's where, where some people go wrong. Okay, guys, we're going to wrap it for today. And uh, please know if you have uh, more questions, put them in the comments section and I'll pick up on them. 
all of this says that unfortunately, if you're the kind of person that says, I really here, am here on Team Healthy and I'm trying to do things in a wise and, and decent and honorable kind of way, there's some people that'll say, not impressed. Okay, that says more about them than it does about you. And know that the schemers are going to continue to be scheming, scheming as a general rule. And that being the case, you do have to kind of pull back and ask, rather than me trying to figure out how to make them act better towards me, maybe I need to decide how I can just stay out of the dance altogether. And I'm going to be true to myself. In other words, individualize rather than think, well, I've got to get that other person to think right. Well, it'd be nice, but if they don't, then let's get you right. And in doing so, you'll have to make decisions relative to how strongly or uh, how permanently you're going to be tied to somebody who is very willing to exploit and manipulate and use you. Practice self-care. Love yourself and and uh, be true to what you know is, is right and best. We call it authenticity. And in the meantime, if the narcissist says, well, I, think, I just think you're an idiot and you're the troublemaker, in your mind, you don't have to say it out loud. It's like, I realize that, which is why I'm in the conundrum that I'm in. So I'm going to make my decision accordingly. All right, guys, uh, we're going to pick up same time, same station next week. Know that I've got some interesting videos coming along here. And uh, just uh, the cumulative effect of this, I hope, is something that's going to be working on your behalf. Know that I really appreciate you letting me be on your journey with you. I'll see you next time. Bye.